Hello, my name is Jess Flaherty. I'm a PhD uh, candidate in literature at the University of New Hampshire. Today we'll be talking about chat GPT in the classroom. Uh, Cameron, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Hi, yeah, I'm Cameron Gibson. I'm a PhD candidate in computational linguistics uh, at the Graduate Center CUNY. I am also a, I moonlight as a data engineer uh, for Google, so yeah. Oh, neat. Okay, so we're gonna jump into some chat GPT today. We'll have about an hour long uh, presentation and there'll be some opportunities for some discussion. Just to start us off, I've made uh, a, a fun kind of, I, I wanted to, it to write a hilarious introduction. Um, I would say it's kind of mildly amusing uh, as it is sort of doing some parenthetical sound here. But let's jump into chat GPT. So first, just sort of some base, basic definitions. What is chat GPT-3? Well, it stands for Generative Pre-Trainer Transformer 3. Those words are kind of complex. Cameron is going to do some more explanations from the hard science side. Uh, just a couple of basic facts, though. So the program is a large language model. And so it, because of that, it can interpret a really wide variety of questions, and it produces unique responses, which is pretty um, amazing in some sense. It does have some limitations. Because it was trained off of data from 2021, it can't incorporate any new information. It can make predictions, which sometimes are kind of accurate and sometimes wildly wrong, which gets into this other problem that researchers are dealing with, which is uh, called these hallucinations. So it will give you very confident warning, wording for something and it will be completely false. Uh, for example, if you ask it to pull a direct quote from a book, it will pull a quote, but that quote does not exist in that book. So it's pretty fascinating. There's also, uh, something happening with this, uh, these human handlers are sort of managing it to make sure it's not producing dangerous content, but people are figuring out how to jailbreak the program. Uh, so for example, you can't get ChatGPT to give you a recipe for methamphetamine. However, if you tell ChatGPT to transform itself into a fantasy world where we're separate from reality, and then you ask it to give it a recipe, it will. So that is another sort of fascinating aspect. And you shouldn't do methamphetamine anyways, but you really shouldn't do methamphetamine from a chat GPT recipe. Other couple of important things here. Chat GPT is owned by this company called OpenAI. It started out as nonprofit and now it has shifted to becoming for profit. So a lot of people are comparing chat GPT to Wikipedia, but Wikipedia is nonprofit and this is now a for profit company, which gets into some ethical issues. So you can use chat GPT. I recommend everyone go and try it while it's still free. Uh, it has 100 million users after only two months, and there are plans to monetize it, watermark content in the future, whether it's for subscriptions or maybe for every search you have to pay. So I'm gonna turn it over to our resident wizard, Mr. Gibson, to sort of explain how this whole process works. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jess. Um, so yeah, in order to understand how chat GPT works, we kind of need to understand a little bit about how uh, ML and the NLP sphere has developed and how where it stands or where uh, ChatGPT kind of comes from. Um, so ChatGPT is one of the, it is the, to date, I believe still, the largest language model that has ever been trained. Um, it's built on top of generative pre-trained model uh, three family. So essentially you have ChatGPT, which is an end product or a user facing product that is built on top of an open AI of open AI's GPT family of transformer models. We'll talk a little bit more about that, what that means um, in a minute. Um, but it is absolutely massive. It has over 175 billion parameters, which for the um, if, if we don't know. So in encoding a parameter is essentially like an argument that you pass to a piece of like to a piece of code. If I, you know, have an add function that says, um, add X to some number, then I would pass X as, you know, just like basic uh, algebra. I would pass X to the function, then it would add it to this. So imagine having 175 billion of these being passed to your model um, as parameters. That That's kind of what that's pointing towards. And it takes 800 gigabytes to store a full um, train, the full train to chat GPT or GPT-3 um, to store it on a hard drive. So it, it's, it's huge. Um, it's a uh, fine tuned. It's a fine tuned general language model. We'll talk about what that little means a little bit in a, in a second. Um, and it's fine tuned using reinforcement learning. We won't get too deep into what reinforcement learning is, but we will talk a little bit about how the reinforcement process works with ChatGPT. Um, it's trained on all the um, 
basically all available uh, language data that exists on the internet only up to uh, the end of 2021 thus far. Um, that's largely because it's extremely expensive to train these models, uh, both uh, computationally, um, environmentally, and also financially. Um, but it performs, uh, you know, state of the art on many few shot multitask uh, settings, um, and it performs well in some zero shot. We'll talk a little bit more about what that specifically means in just a second. So how does GPT-3 um, and therefore chat GPT, how does it work? So chat GPT, or is built again on top of the GPT uh, transformer architecture. So what a transformer is, is largely, it is one of the newer architectures that exist, that is kind of a borrowed thing out of um, computer vision. Um, and it's essentially this, this architecture that is built on a concept of self-attention. Um, so in the past, um, basically when you're dealing with NLP tasks, we're looking at a lot of sequence to seek, what we would call sequence to sequence tasks, where we're trying to get um, uh, our model uh, to predict the next word in a sequence, whether that be, you know, under the concept of machine translation, where we're trying to get it to translate from one language to another, or whether we're just trying to, you know, get like what your email does and predict the next word that's going to come in the context of the sentence that you're typing. That's largely, up until fairly recently, been a product of a lot of uh, Bayesian probabilistic statistics. Um, what the transformer model did was it introduced um, kind of like a wraparound or like a bypass, people wanted to get rid of that um, because it's very expensive and it takes a long time. And so kind of just like out of nowhere, somebody came up with this, this idea of self-attention, which basically we can't get too deep into it because it, it's, it's kind of complex to explain, but essentially just understand that it is linear algebra. So basically you take an input, which could be a sentence, a word or whatever, and you create what is called a, a, an embedding which is largely just a tensor or an array or a list of numbers that represents that word, that input in some meaningful way to the model. And what it's gonna do is it's going to pass it through layers um, from one end, uh, from the input layer into this, uh, through a series of layers and then to an attention layer that's gonna do some matrix math and basically be able to draw these global like um, dependencies um, that's going to kind of help us predict uh, output from the input. Um, that's a very, it's a very difficult thing to kind of like explain in, in <laughs> uh, highbrow uh, concepts, but that's fine because technically in the CS world, we don't really know why it does well at these tasks anyway. It, it, it's an architecture that works, but we don't really know why it works well for language tasks or, you know, the tasks that it works well for. So it's, you know, just understanding that attention is kind of the main mechanism that works here and that what we're trying to do is basically we're just doing some black boxy matrix math that basically uh, allows the, the, the model to look at words in context and to be able to, as the, the name um, suggests, understand what words in context it's supposed to be attending to as it's making its prediction. So if I give it a sentence, it's going to look at this sentence and it's going to say, okay, I've seen, you know, this word I've like, so I could say like, um, I'm giving this talk with Jess. It's going to look at I, and then it's going to look at the rest of the sentence. And then it's going to look at am, uh, cause it's probably going to break those up. And it's going to look at the rest of the sentence and then it's going to look at giving, and then it's going to continue on. And basically through this series of math, it's going to be able to figure out what words matter as it's progressing to the sentence in order to make a prediction about what is supposed, about what the output should be. So that's how the general architecture works. Um, and that kind of results, this, this model, you so basically to train a GPT or any large uh, language model, what you do is you basically do what we've talked about here, where you pass it a ton of data as like, basically like as right now the going, uh, um, <laughs> Uh, standard is to get kind of just pass it as much language data as you, as you possibly can. And what you have it do is you split that data up into a training set. So think about it as like a student studying for a test. Um, you have your training set, which would be basically like your study guide. And then you, you would have like what is called a validation set, which is kind of like, think of that as like, you know, if you gave your students like a pretest before the real test, um, and then you give it like a test set, which is the actual test itself to see how well they it's learned the tasks. And so these tests um, take the form of a multitude of, uh, there's different types of tests basically in a nutshell. 
um, and different types of learning that we might ask our model to do, right? So this is where this concept of zero, one shot or few shot training, learning tasks, learning and learning transfer comes into play where a zero uh, shot task uh, learning task is basically you are asking your model to perhaps, um, okay, let me, let me start for actually, <laughs> sorry. Um, we have to also, so there's a, a concept of basically multitask learning in model learning, um, where most models are trained to do one specific thing, right? So most of the models that I train are uh, models that work with various languages. And so it's going to look like can you uh, translate this, this uh, can you learn to translate English into Spanish? And that's all that the model is going to be trained to do. Um, so uh, we have to speed up a little bit, um, but basically you can ask, actually do uh, what is called multitask learning, where you might ask the model to learn not only how to do machine translation, but also to do question and answer. Um, so I might, you know, also like basically, which is what ChatGPT is is uh, expected to do. It's expected to learn. Uh, it's a multitask learning model, um, and that's kind of what makes it important and useful. Um, so part of that, though, is how do we actually test how much the model has learned? This is where the zero, one shot, and few shot task learning and transfer comes in. Under these contexts, usually when you have a model that has been trained to do one thing, you would ask it at test time to only predict classes or things that it has seen. So if I'm trying to predict, say, who, like male from female um, in, in a data set of given tasks, then at test time, I'm only going to ask it to predict one of two categories. However, the, the intuition with models is that if it is truly learned, then it should be able to predict classes that it has not seen as well. And that's where zero, one shot, and few shot learning, uh, learning and transfer comes in, where at test time, we may ask for learning, we might ask it to predict a class it has not seen. So say if I've trained a model to from pictures, images to predict cat, dog, um, and squirrel. Well, at test time, um, I might ask it to predict, if I'm doing one shot training, I might ask it to do cat, dog, squirrel, and elephant, or something like that. Uh, and then, so the name as it's just few shots would be we add a couple of more classes to that and zero shot as we add a bunch more. Um, the same thing for transfer, right, where we're asking it to complete a task. So in the case of asking a computer to look at um, uh, to look at these these animals, um, we um, excuse me, we might ask it. We're asking it to do a classification task. Per, tell me what class this picture belongs to. Well, the going intuition for is the same for task with these with these trainings as well, where we might ask it to do a bunch of different model or, or a bunch of different tasks. And we would expect it to be able to learn how to do tasks it has not seen. So the way that these models actually work and are generally trained these days is for multitask, multi-learning, multi-trans, and like and zero under is for multitask performance under zero one shot or few shot uh, learning and or task transfer um, benchmarks. So that's the way that we test. Um, so essentially what happens though is once we've trained the model, um, so we, we do, this training process kind of takes place in two spheres. Um, it takes place in a sphere of what is called uh, semi-supervised learning, um, which is basically comprised, comprised of unsupervised pre-training and supervised pre-training. Unsupervised just means that it doesn't have labels. So, um, and supervised means that it does have labels. So unsupervised would mean that um, essentially given the task, we're just asking it to learn what it can about the given training data that it's seen. And then in a supervised task, we're learning, asking it to learn specific qualities, factors, or elements about the language that it, or the, about what it's seen. Um, so, under the con, like, so this, the, the training of a chat GP3 model, um, or a chat GPT model, or a GPT3 takes advantage of both of these, where essentially, in order to get a base concept of all these language products, we're going to uh, basically pre train unsupervised, we're going to just unleash it on a whole bunch of data and ask it to learn as much as it can about the relationships between the inputs of the data and, you know, some output. And then we're going to go back and for specific tasks, we're going to fine tune which means basically make it more specific, make it learn things that are more specific for a given task. 
which is the architecture that GPT-3 is built on. So kind of to revisit the whole idea of reinforcement learning, I'm kind of going to just like skip this, uh, the graphic. I kind of wanted to walk through the graphic, but I'm kind of running low on time and we might be able to revisit that later. Um, but essentially that is a, a graph that explains the policy um, that or the, the process by which chat GPT is, is trained. Um, it involves a lot of humans. It's very expensive. And it's iteratively updated, but not very frequently because it's so expensive, both human intensive and computationally expensive. Um, so, but we can circle back around to that um, per, perhaps by the end. Jess, can you go to the next slide? Um, so what are these, what, what types of tasks are LLMs generally good at? Um, they're good at high resource language tasks and generally templatic explanation document formulations. So when I say a high resource language task, that means that languages that have a lot of data that are openly available on the internet. So languages like English or Chinese or Spanish or many of the Romance languages, first world countries. It does really well on those because there's a lot of available data. What does that mean though? That means that there's a lot of languages that aren't represented. Um, you have to look at again, like who has access to the internet, all of these sociological um, properties that we have to consider when looking at uh, basically the concept that the internet is not as diverse of a place as we think. But for the places where it is, you know, where communities and populations are represented, then uh, the, the models tend to perform very well on that because it sees a lot of data. Um, and as far as uh, templatic document formation, so essentially the more pattern-like, because again, all this is is a bunch of really high level pattern recognition, that's going on and replication of patterns that it's seen in data. So anything that is templatic or formulaic as far as the document's formulation um, or whatever the task is, then the model's probably going to be very good at that, particularly when it's guided by domain expert knowledge. Um, we, we're gonna have a whole ethics talk about that because there's a lot of uh, you know assumed domain expertise that is just kind of, uh, that is assumed the model is getting just by releasing it on the internet that it doesn't. Um, so conversely, what types of tasks are LLMs bad for? Um, generally, uh, generally high stakes categories. So e.g. healthcare, um, where again, like as we've discussed, models like GPT-3, they have a tendency, you know, to make very strong statements that may not be very well founded. Well, what does that mean when uh, you know, when you're giving a diagnosis to a patient or, you know, when you're doing some high stakes um, task, uh, it, it can result in really bad outcomes for end users that is, again, often overlooked or, you know, forgotten. Um, and then also tasks that include persons uh, from low resource or marginalized communities for the reasons mentioned above. So, Essentially, some general takeaway points. Uh, consider chat GPT as like something of an automated Reddit commenter or Redditor, like so a Reddit commenter or commentor, excuse me. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. Um, so basically, again, think about this is the type of information that it's been trained on. So what it's largely doing is it's going to basically look through the vast amount of data that it's seen on the internet, find what it thinks is the most is a, is a reasonable response and render it in a unique way. But that doesn't mean that it does like, just like, you know, when you look, read through chat forums and you see something that's like, wow, that was actually crazy. Chat GPT doesn't know that. It doesn't know that that's a crazy thing to say about this topic. So it's going to, it might spit that out as a, as a byproduct. Um, so yeah, and it's, uh, it's super expensive to train. So this is why the updates, you know, are iteratively slow and why you don't see, you know, again, it's still only been trained on data up to 2021. Um, and it can be used, it, it can be useful when viewed as an aid or a tool for domain experts. So I think that's a good place to leave it right now. And maybe we'll be able to circle back around and I can kind of fill in some gaps with questions later. Perfect. Thank you, Cameron. Um, a lot of great information. My head just hurts a little bit more now. Uh, any specific questions on the nuts and bolts of chat GPT? A lot of stuff going on here, obviously, very complicated algorithms and things. Uh, any questions from the audience for Cameron? And I will I will point out that it's it's not very, you know, necessary to know a, a ton about the nuts and bolts. If you really just want to know how these model works, having a general understanding of, again, just like, what the architecture is and you know kind of how it does things is much more relevant um than you know going into like the actual maths behind what's going on okay uh if there are no questions we'll go ahead and move on uh, i wanted to have a nice little break slide here so if, if you're familiar with mid journey i've uh I, i've 
mess around with this. It's an image generation software. And so I've asked Midjourney to draw a picture of what ChatGPT looks like. So if we just want to uh, see what what the what the machine thinks of itself, that's oh wow, that's what it that's what it that's what it did. No, I'm just kidding. That's a picture of the Terminator. That joke's for Peter. So let's pivot into talking about the ethical and moral concerns of using ChatGPT now that we know some uh, more basic facts about it. Uh, the biggest issue that I have taken away from ChatGPT so far is that it has a lot of bias. There have been much smarter people than me who have run it through all sorts of political trainers and it comes out you know, right down there uh, in the bottom left. And uh, not only that, it has bias with race and gender and all kinds of other things. Uh, that's because, as Cameron said, this was scraped data from humans and then it was programmed by humans and now it's being handled and trained by humans. So we've got bias all the way through and you know, feminism and standpoint theory give us some information there. Chat GPT, as Cameron also said, it is extremely it's consuming enormous amounts of energy. It's running on the world's fifth most powerful supercomputer and something like a hundred times more energy goes into a chat GPT search than like a Google search. So that's your eco criticism there. And this is the one that I, after doing some research was the most disturbed by. Um, and that's that open AI paid tech workers in Africa less than $2 an hour to weed out the psychologically traumatic content because it scraped all that data from the internet. It took some really horrible things such as, you know, bestiality and like child abuse and uh, people in Africa were paid very little to weed through those things and they, there is psychological harm there and so we're seeing this post-colonialism even in open AI and there's a great article at the end from time if you haven't read the time article on this subject it is absolutely sort of mind opening in terms of like do I want to use this program so we'll lead into a discussion and I think these are sort of our two big discussion questions. Number one, OpenAI is not like Wikipedia. It's, it is a company motivated by money. Uh, do we want to use this sort of program if uh, we know our money is going to these big corporations that are not being ethical? And uh, it's free right now, but do we, how much is it going to cost once we're hooked? Right? How much are those subscription fees going to be? Also, and this has been the other big question is, can we use this in the classroom as a teaching tool or does it encourage sort of an intellectual laziness and i've been using it pretty extensively i'm teaching an introduction to literature course and i'm i'm not quite sure what to think about this because i taught my students how to use chat gpt to make outlines as cameron said it's really good at formulaic writing so it will make you a wonderful outline for a paper but isn't part of the learning process doing the outline yourself and doesn't that make your paper better or is it okay to use a chat gpt outline i don't know that is going to be your opportunity to talk about it and i am going to take notes while you do so jess i have a, a question and sort of in addition to that that came up from some of what you said which is uh are we provide while chat gpt is free right now are we providing free labor to the people who are going to make billions of dollars off it by using mm. it uh, I don't know if you've heard about a camera, but I would say absolutely. The reason it's free right now is because all of that data that you're cranking through it is being uh, basically a, a free beta tester. So, um, and that's another aspect, but you know, anything you put on, on the internet, right? You are the product um, if it's free. So, yeah, I mean, to follow up on that, it's, it's, it's a yes and a no, like the data itself is Again, like anything you like and whenever you uh, sign up for terms of service for any, you know, social media, any site like that, generally your data now becomes, you know, available to any person that knows how to scrape a website, um, including, you know, these big subsidiaries who, you know, everybody kind of you can't really get around Google um, all that much. There are, you know, um, so like basically the 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 the, the portion that, that Jess is talking about with um it's very difficult to find good and, um, you know, or just find data, you know, people that are willing and wanting to, you know, just wade through logs of data. You don't find them anywhere. So it's it's one of those things where you're basically forced to outsource to anyone, but the pay rates, as you, as Jess pointed out, 
are kind of ludicrous and egregious, but it's it it's falls in line totally with um you know what other you know major uh distributors do as far as uh you know like the Nikes and you know like having your you know your production uh shops in China and things of that general nature so you don't have to pay people as much. Um so it's 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 that two factor problem where you have um you know, just just a larger population of people that are willing to do the labor. And then also you, like industry is at, um, you don't have to pay them as much. Just, you know, legally, nobody is regulating any of that, which is, it's it's pretty bad and horrible. Um, and it's just, you know, again, it's, ethics is a, is a very big <laughs> issue in AI that, um, that we're, you know, constantly fighting and battling. Um, I think, um... A couple of questions in, in the in the chat. Um, I, Angela, I have that link so I can stick that in the chat in two seconds. Uh, but Peter has a question about the Terminator image um, about, uh, you know, is chat GPT becoming Skynet? Is this the nice Skynet? Um, what, what do you guys, I mean, it's a sort of robot overlord question. Um, I also think a relative, relevant question to that too is just this name artificial intelligence right which is an interesting one to talk about when you're talking about learning communities like is is this an intelligent um program i can see cam going no no so maybe you guys could talk a little bit about that and how close we are to like robot overlords nowhere near <laughs> um yeah no it's like again like when you talk about success on a lot of the, these benchmarks that when you talk about success they talk about 99% accuracy on this or that or the third, but I mean, you can see from the chat GPT responses itself, like it, it is not intelligently responding, it is responding because linguistically speaking, like again, language use is, is not terribly varied, particularly when you're talking about rendered and like rendered writing. So, you know, predicting what word's going to come, you know, after the next word to make something sound, you know, intelligible is not like a terribly difficult task, particularly for a computer to, you know, like there's been, you know, programs that have done that forever. Um, it's more, yeah, but like we're nowhere near like as far as like AI being able to produce, uh, you know, or, you know, being sentient in any way. No, no, not even close. <laughs> um, they are still as, as you know, everybody in my workplace says daily, it's like our computers are very stupid still. So <laughs> um, I, I just, um, I just wanted to chime in on that. And I put something in here about in the chat about this, that I think for me, the thing, it almost scares me more that we, whether it's intelligent or not, the fact that it seems intelligent to us, and I'm sure lots of people, for example, have seen the story, it wasn't with Chappie G GPT, but the story last week of the journalist who kind of trolled the Bing chat um, and basically got it to like uh, say that it was sentient and that it was it had feelings and that it was in love with him. And it was, you know, kind of this ludicrous like dialogue and knowing what you know about what's actually happening under the hood, it's easy like for you to look at that and say, oh, but that's not what's really happening. But for most people who are reading that and that journalist who like was rather shook by this, um, I think it's, that is what scares me more in some ways right now is that we don't necessarily know what it is we're dealing with. And it's easy to assume that this is intelligence or this is sentience and that colors our relationship with the technology and with the information that it then gives us. Yeah, no, it's super important. And like, there is like, certainly, you know, a, a, it's again, it's something that we're combating like in the field as it stands now, where you have like a group of people that are, you know, basically it's now like this budgeting field of AI ethics, which is, you know, basically combating that, that this, this notion that is, entrenched in the AI community that, you know, we are trying to move towards, you know, some sentience and, you know, making these grand statements about, uh, you know, uh, AI learning and like, oh, it does things like humans. It's like, no, it's it like, it is a computer. Like we do not have, you know, processors in our brains. Our brains do not have, we don't have self-attention in, in like, we don't like, so the way self-attention kind of works is you read, like the, the machine reads a sentence and input forwards and then backwards, and then does a whole bunch of statistical. When I read, I don't read a sentence backwards, you know? So like, like it's, it's a different type of information encoding, but it's not, you know, like, again, it's not like, again, like we're moving towards, uh, you know, 
like you know it being like thinking like a human and having it's just again it's like think of it as like a, it's a glorified calculator in a way it's doing really really good statistics because it has really really strong hardware and it's seen you know basically everything there is to you know see on the internet so if you ask a machine if you give it the entirety of the internet and tell it to you know do stats and predict and produce the most probable sounding response to said thing that's what it's going to do and it's going to do it pretty well but you know again like you said there is certainly you know it's scary you know to like from the inside the community when you see the responses because for me it's like we get a new we get a new model every six months now that's you know supposed to be more powerful than the next and blah 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 and so on and so forth and then there is the public backlash you know against like you know what it's doing and how it's outputting stuff and it's like well we have to go you know put out that fire you know again so it's kind of one of those things where it's like we 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 there's a lot of conversation about how do you you know inform people about what this is and how it's doing because big industry isn't going to do it because they want you to think that it is you know basically uh i i robot you know like cuz that's what's going to sell it you know they love the mystique cuz well, can... the whole idea of a chat interface Exactly. is designed to kind of suck you into I was just telling Robin in a chat that like for fun I asked chat GPT to to tell a story tell me a story about myself like I gave it my name and it did and it was it was pretty accurate actually and of course it's using publicly available information about me that it was trained on because that's on the internet but it's very different feeling to read that as a story somebody's telling about me versus doing a google search of my name and seeing essentially all of that information, but fragmented and not narr in a narrative. And that's the thing. If you don't know that like specifically the way that this is basically like what happens is, is like it does that same internet search, but then the policy, like basically the way that they've trained it and the way that they've shown it data is to reformat that into a dialogue based format that involves a lot of humans. Like basically you have human people that are grading, you know, the responses and ranking them and then saying like, okay, now model, like if you receive this prompt, give a response that is very close to this. So it's like, it is it is going to have that feeling of like, again, talking to, you know, another person or a human because there are humans still involved in the loop, um, very heavily involved in the loop. Um, and, you know, like you said, it is it is scary because I, I do know Google's Google's version of this is coming. Um, they're already geared up and, and ready to go. And it's going to be, it's going to reach more people and be even bigger. Um, and I'm, I am concerned about like, you know, like they're trying to uh, basically convert a lot of the chat in, or like the Google search interface to be more conversational like this, right. um, as opposed to just a straight information retrieval search, which again, like you said, removes that disconnect, um, you know, or like it, it removes the option to, you know, to understand like, okay, I've asked this a question and now it's given me a list of things that I can then choose to look at versus it telling me, hey, this is truth, you know? Um, it's kind of, yeah, it's, but it's still, you know, it's humans that are pushing that. Not really so much. Yeah, the machine so interesting. Yeah. Jess just texted me that he's having internet trouble because he's oh, in no. Maine and we all know about Maine. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Maine. Um, but so I, I would have a question though for Cameron, as someone who's who's a teacher and a, and also a writer, um, what do you wish people who are not computer scientists knew and understood about ChatGPT and artificial intelligence generally? You now, as you're working with students, what would you like students to know? Um, I think it would be more of like it's the same as what we you know kind of want them to you know learn and understand about. Uh, the composition, well, for me, it was composition, you know, when I was teaching is that, you know, in order to be able to use, like, first, you have to view it as a tool, not as a replacement of, you know, work or anything like that. If you view it as a tool, as like a, a smart clippy, then, you know, you, you're in a great spot. But even when you have a smart clippy, or, you know, when you're searching stuff, you still have to have some domain expertise in order to be able to weed out, you know, when it's saying things that are weird. So it's like more about, again, like understanding how to complete your research, doing your own independent research, um, understanding that, again, this is like a tool that can aid you in taking out some of the tediousness of certain tasks. Like I 100% think that, you know, if, uh, you know, if chat GPT helps you make outlines, then that's great. Outlining is, can be kind of tedious. Um, it's a useful exercise though for preparing for writing. 
Um, so if you can get something that will do that for you, then that's great. But then like actually having it write the essay and not being able to, you know, to vet it appropriately or double check or anything like that, then that's where you run into it because you're robbing yourself of skills in a nutshell. Um, and that's at the end of the day going to hurt you later on down the road. Like I think most of academia is about getting students to understand, you know, how to do things efficiently without actually robbing themselves of acquiring the skill set that they're going to need later on in life <laughs> um, to be able to achieve. Because as you said, like chat GPT, it's still fairly stupid and it's not going to get any, you know, it's not going to get smarter anytime soon. Um, so there, it's, it's, it's kind of like rabbit holy. Um, and that like for me as a person that codes every day, one thing that I hate doing is writing documentation. <laughs> I, it, it takes so long to, you know, write, write out comments and, you know, so that way I can post this and somebody else can know how to use what I'm doing without having to sit there for hours and wade through it. Something like chat GPT is great for something like that because it can read through code and like basically come up with a tentative explanation for what my code is doing. So I still have to know how to write the code. Now it just kind of takes some of that workload off of me of having to go back and actually generate documentation, but I still have to vet it because it might be wrong. Like I do know, you know, so it's like that. I saw there's more hands. Kristen's got her hand I, up in the room. So we got her first and then back to Zoom. Um, yeah. I was just gonna say in our class, we had to listen to the podcast. I'm blanking on the name of the podcast itself. It was like, we think our brains are computers, they're not. Mm -hmm. And talk about the importance of understanding, like sometimes, by trying to be more efficient and productive, we lose out on creativity and how, you know, oh, these people want to interview an author. One of them could read the book, write the questions. The other could ask the questions and do the interview. But instead, they both read the book. They both take notes. They write questions. They discuss it. They work on a board. They go back to it. And almost in a similar way with certain things, if ChatGTP is writing an outline for you it's then taking away from an opportunity for you yourself to be thinking about the material that you're trying to uh, write about like be like even just while writing out that outline there's like the conscious brainstorming part and then there's like the subconscious stuff where it's just like sitting in your head while you're trying to plan your outline yes that's a perfect connection because there's a lot of the stuff we've been talking about that connects to the podcast we listen to between uh, conversation between Ezra Klein and Annie Murphy Paul because Annie Murphy Paul wrote a wonderful book called The Extended Mind, mm -hmm. Extended Brain, Extended Mind. I think The Extended Mind. Mm -hmm. I love the book. And it's a fascinating conversation because they really do bring that up. Ezra Klein says, you know, I could just read the book and my producer could, could support us, but we both read it so that we can talk about it and come up with questions and reiterate like that. Great stuff. There were other hands on Zoom. Well, that was me, but your, your student just kind of answered my question in some ways because, and this was going to be a question for everybody, not just um, our presenters, so like in the chat or anywhere, but I guess one question I have as we're thinking about things like academic integrity and cheating, right, which is like the main academic discourse going on about chat GPT right now. Mm -hmm. I guess a question, you know, and this is, I think Libby is talking about this in the chat as well, plagiarism. But I guess my question is, let's say, like Cameron said, I'm not cheating myself of any skill. Let's say I could do the thing myself, okay? But I also, like, instead of doing that, I use chat GPT. So I'm thinking about myself, for example, let's say I have an idea for an article. I'm a professor. I know I can write the article, right? It would probably take me a week. Um, but instead, I input some stuff to chat GPT, it writes it for me, I go through it, I change a couple of things that are wonky, and there's my article. I guess my question is, and, and this is why I like what, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, this um, person who just spoke, but I like the idea that something is still lost um, because in that quest for efficiency, because you do lose the unexpected things that would have happened. <laughs> had you spread your work out in a time-based, you know, sequence. Um, so I guess I feel like even if I don't really think of that so much as an ethics violation, I definitely think of it as a loss to humanity in terms of what is possible in our world, because what we're going to end up with is a whole bunch of like much more predictable things, perhaps. I don't know. Um, 
Anyway, yeah. I'm happy to hear what anyone has to say about that. Well, I mean, I can chime in on that. I mean, fortunately, like, so fortunately, I mean, down the road, like, again, industry is always going to push for, you know, getting stuff out there before. But fortunately, like, generators, so generative models like ChatGPT also make really good discriminators. <laughs> um, so for everything that ChatGPT generates, it tends to be also very good about identifying stuff that it generated. So down the line, if there is call for it, I imagine that OpenAI would, it's kind of like, so like this whole thing happened with Facebook a while back where um, when, I forget which modeling and stuff it was, but basically like when a lot of the whole fake uh, profile started popping up. It was off. It might have been off the back of GPT. Um, yeah, I think it was GPT one when it first came out. Um, it was basically they were. It was being bombarded, uh, like Facebook and a lot of social medias were being bombarded or were going to be bombarded by fake posts from fake profiles because Chat GP or because GPT the first model was better than the detectors. It could not that their detectors could not identify. The generated text from uh, GPT. So what they did was uh, they basically contacted all these social media distributors like, hey, we're going to hold off on releasing this be so that way you guys can update, you know, your discriminators with, you know, this technology. So it hasn't worked all that well, I don't think, but I feel like part of that's because Facebook hasn't. But just for the first thing, there is, if there is demand, there is the ability to detect do do cheating detection and things like that it won't be perfect there will still be you know people that slip through the cracks and this or that or the third um but at the end of the day it does basically rob us of like basically what all the things that we're talking about with all of this is like cheating you of learning about yourself which is like what you know academia and you know the college journey is all about is like learning about your like sitting with your outline and learning how to write an outline is then therefore teaching you how to think critically and therefore teaching you to understand how you know, to to go about the business of writing, you know, text from start to finish. If you skip all of that <laughs> and just go straight to the end product, you have missed out on all that. And then you will therefore probably do a worse job of going back and doing the editing and all of that kind of stuff uh, post, you know, um, the, the generation than you would if you had spent the time up front to master the skill set first. And then it is actually functioning as an aid as opposed to a replacement. Um, but overall, yeah, I do think we, we, you probably will, you know, like there's always going to be, you know, those people just with the internet being what it is and the connectivity and the way that the world is connected via the digital these days, there will always be those people who have no interest in, you know, the creative portion of humanity. It's about the quick return. And that's what business is all about is, you know, margins and profits and all, you know, all those lines. So it is about, you know, like the emphasis is there. Um, and so there has to be like, you know, I think it will probably hit ahead and turn around once enough students go into the workforce without having the skills that they need, because again, <laughs> you, can't use, you can't really use any of these effectively if you don't have domain expertise. Like it's just not really feasible to be able, you can have cheap chat GPT or whatever do stuff for you, but if it doesn't work, if it's not good, um, if it's incorrect, you know, all of that kind of stuff, then you're not really contributing to the efficiency of whatever system you're a part of. Um, so you're still going to have to acquire the, 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 the skill set one way or the other. Um, mm -hmm. So hopefully I feel like, you know, there's always this initial rubber band push in one direction to kind of like cut people out and, you know, push towards the automatic and make everything easier. But I feel like it always rubber bands back in a, in a different way as people, you know, kind of, <laughs> as people realize, hey, this A isn't as good as we thought it was, and, you know, B, people are now, you know, not as efficient at the job as they used to be. Um, and it's kind of like this weird negotiation. Um, and there's also in uh, the chat, Maeve has brought up, and thankfully, uh, the issue that happened with Clark's World, which is a, an online science fiction magazine that has generally opened to submissions and famous for, for quickly processing submissions, uh, Neil Clark, the owner and editor of that, had to close down for his submissions, pause submissions, because he got so overwhelmed with spam from chat GPT of essentially fake short stories. Mm. Because And it, it's so perplexing. And it's happening to multiple magazines. It's not just Clark's World. He happened to write about it very clearly and, and had some graphs to show that it was very much correlated to the rise of chat GPT. 
Um, but it's very strange that people want to submit short stories that essentially they haven't written yeah. in massive amount. Like, <laughs> why is this happening? What is the purpose? Yeah. Do you think that's like people saying like, do you think it's kind of a little bit of like a gimmick effect of like this just came out in December and people are like, oh, I'm going to see if I can use it. I mean, I wonder if that's going to like die down because like what's you're not going to it's not going to go anywhere. Like, what's the point of doing that? It just seems so, performative. It's, it's causing so many problems right now. Yeah, it's it's kind of like again, it's it's one of those issues of, again, just pushing this open face it's an issue of like the AI and like, you know, the push for making things basically the, the soda push for state of the art. If you can make something state of the art and get it out of the public, then you can make more money than all your competitors. And again, like, I think there's a comment in the, uh, uh, in the, in the, about like, you know, being able to catch AI generated stuff. Well, the, the, the thing is, is that the, the catcher, the discriminator would have to be, would have to come from the same people that built the original model. If other people are built because open AI is not like a, they're not an open source, you know, thing like I we don't have access to you know again the infrastructure like it's expensive like in order to train said uh you know discriminator it's the same process basically you know just a different task as training um the generator which is incredibly expensive again so now you've doubled your expense for a product that people aren't you know outside of the people in this room are really going to be asking for you know so that's that's what you're really combating is again just like the economic it's totally doable to you know again to generate a discriminator for open ai to make a discriminator that would be able to catch something like 95 96 probably percent of all generated architecture but the issue is it's going to cost them a lot of money and then i like the clark world example pushed out because part of that tweet thread was like yes discriminators exist but they're, you know, most of them are way too expensive for a small publisher to, to implement, you know? Um, it's not cheap to use machine learning stuff. It's cheap to use chat, G, chat uh, GPT, but, you know, the, the, the back end portions of it and the other stuff that are, that would be used for, you know, safety and protection is, um, is not cheap. <laughs> um, and that's, it's just something that you're battling is because, you know, the AI, the people in charge in most of these AI spaces do not care about that. <laughs> um, Before we maybe see if um, some students want to chat, I, I should just point out that Jess is here. And if I don't know if he's frozen or not, but if you want to say anything, now's your chance while you're actually in the room. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about my main internet. I hope I haven't been able to take notes, uh, but I uh, hope. <laughs> and that was fascinating. I, I, you know, what if it turned out that Jess was actually a hologram produced by a computer program um, and he's glitching. Um, uh, so there's lots of students here. Martha asked in the chat, um, what, what do you guys think about it and how are people using it and what comments do you have, whether you're online or in the room? I want to know what what folks like about it um, to the other Libby. <laughs> um, as a teaching lecturer, you know, I'm thinking back of my first time last semester teaching a TWP course, thinking back to some of these submissions I received and like very likely were generated by ChatGPT or something because they were almost nonsensical. Um, and it, and I, you know, the, due to my, um, you know, non-traditional grading policy, um, blanking on words right now, but, you know, I gave them opportunities to re redo the work, but most of the time they did not. And me trying to evaluate and, and understand what was happening, you know, for this student and their learning was like, I just would look at it and like throw my hand in the air, like, this makes no sense. Like, I don't understand, you know? Um, yeah, and so like the, the comment, um, you know, that friends have tried it and they like it, what what do they like about it? Um, and how do they use it, you know? Yeah, uh, 
since my internet's not working again, I guess we can jump in. That's a great question. Uh, how, how do students use this? How are they using it? And how can you use it as an instructor? And I have gone full chat GPT with my introduction to literature course this semester. So I'm gonna give you this, sort of a basic outline of how I've run it. And also I based this off of another talk I went to from the University of uh, the American University at Cairo, I think uh, Maha Bali uh, led that talk. And so that was really informative also. So if you're going to use this in a classroom, I think uh, like any new technology, you should start out by just introducing it to the whole class, get GP, chat GPT up in the screen and just let students ask you questions for a good 10 or 15 minutes and see what pops out, see what they want to know. And that way it sort of gets some of the mystery out of the way. And also you can upload the responses to a shared document. That way they don't have to make their own account. So that's the first thing I did. We just sort of messed around with it. Next thing I did was assign like a very generic uh, prompt, 250, 300 words, responding to a well-known text. So I did uh, Michelle de Montagne's assize. I had every student pick a different assai. And then after they had turned their assignment in, I had ChatGPT write the same essay at the same length. And I tried to even like if a student wrote sort of a funny essay, I asked it to use the humorous tone. If it wrote in first person, I asked ChatGPT to use first person. And then I brought them all in and let students compare their own writing to the chat GPT machine. And then we had sort of a nice reflection. So that's something else that you can do. Uh, outlining, again, I don't know if you've talked about that, but it's this seems to be where chat GPT really is the strongest. I, I know people who I will let them stay anonymous. Uh, they're using it for formal emails and recommendation letters. Ooh. So, um, you know, is that ethical? I don't know. It writes a pretty good recommendation letter because they're pretty formulaic. So you can also critique chat GPT essays in small groups. I printed out a bunch of essays and then we sat down and critiqued them. And probably the last lesson I, I wanna do is to mix human essays, not my current students, but other human essays with chat GPT essays. And then we'll see if we can sort of figure out which ones they're the machine and which ones are the people. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, this was a idea that Cameron had because he's more up on ethics and AI. But uh, you, if you ask ChatGPT a question and then it gives you an answer, uh, going and looking where possibly could that information be coming from. So doing sort of a, a sleuthing sort of activity. Mm -hmm. So there's some pedagogy sort of ideas for you. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Bryn, um, who I know teaches um, composition, probably among other things. And she's interested in if you create assignments that ask students to share specific personal experience and incorporate specific sources, is chat GPT actually going to be able to do even that, whether it's poorly or, or well? Chat GPT, if you're teaching English composition, can write a pretty good personal narrative essay, which is wild. I asked it to write me an essay about falling in love with hiking in the White Mountains. It didn't do a very good job the first time. So I tweaked my response and I said, write an essay about falling in love with in the White Mountains and use lots of vivid sensory details and, you know, five senses. And then it produced an essay that I probably would have given an A. So, um, the machine really can do some amazing things in that sense. The thing that it can't do, the number one way to break it is to ask it to write something and not use one letter. You know, So if you say, write this thing and don't use the letter T, the machine can't do it. It'll break every time. Or, yeah, you're gonna have to like, I mean, I think it's gonna make, you know, for probably like for the people that really experiment with it in the classroom, it's gonna make for better writers long-term because you're going to have to get more creative with the types of assignments. You can't use cookie cut boilerplate or, you know, the five paragraph essay is probably going to have to go, you know, but like, again, like one of the, like the more diverse and off the beaten path that, you know, you make your assignments, the worst chat GPT is going to be about generating things that are going to be able to accommodate. Um, and, but again, like if you like, it's, it's very bad at like, not like reusing the same utterances. So if you ask it, like, basically, I like, and it's going to have a lot to do with, like, you know, again, like, your students, like, they would have to, they're going to have to work really hard for certain essays and for certain things to get a prompt that's going to, you know, you have to be pretty creative to come up with a prompt, like, what Jess 
just, you know, had to reprompt in order to get a good personal nar narrative, you know? So you, you like, you already have to have some, some level of, you know, creativity in order to get to a place where you can prompt the machine to make certain things. But then if you give them certain restrictions, like, hey, you can't use the same, I, this is, you know, ludicrous, but you can't use the same sentence t twice or the same type of sentence twice, you know, in this, it's going to make them a think more about, you know, the right, the words that they're putting on the page from a compositional perspective. Um, and also, you know, it's going to make it more difficult for something like a statistical machine that is, again, largely trained to put words in specific contexts, and it's going to be biased towards certain arrangements more than others and certain responses. So yeah, as instructors, getting more creative about what you ask your students to write about and, you know, is going to become, you know, pivotal, uh, you know, to kind of like, I won't say to combating these or, you know, forcing them into the place where they belong. Yeah. And also to bounce off of that, Cameron, you can always have them write on either A, something that's after 2021, something that's new because the machine is not trained on it, or B, something that's kind of obscure that the machine will hallucinate on. For example, uh, I study Philip K. Dick. He's so, sort of like the big figure in my scholarship. And Chat GPT writes really horrible Philip K. Dick essays because there's not a lot of information out there on him. But if you ask it to write, uh, literary criticism on Foucault's Panopticon, it will give you a very good essay because you know that's something that's really popular. So it's going to force instructors for sure to dig more into the, like you know the marginalized scholarships. And again, anything current event, like if you keep your stuff, hey, write about you know things that are happening quite in a more relevant context. Hey, I think it's you know generally easier for students to follow along with. But again, like they're not updating these models every week. Like it's again so. It's not going to know about stuff that, you know, just happened probably perhaps yesterday or, you know, something like that. I don't know. We'll actually have to see whether because, like, again, some of that man is manually reprompted um, or some of that information might be manually being encoded somehow. Um, Can I ask a question related to that, um, Cameron, that I'm curious about? It, because when when it came out and and the information that was available was made available about what it could do and it couldn't do. And I knew that was one of the things. And sure enough, I couldn't get it to talk to me about anything more recent than 21. But one of the things that I remember reading was that it was not trained to do translations, but I was able to get it to talk to me in Spanish. <laughs> so I was really curious about like what that meant in terms of how it's being trained and what the difference is between training it to do translation Versus obviously it's been exposed to different languages through its training and it's learned how to use those languages. It, is that something you can explain at all? Yeah, no, it, it's 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 very much part of that multi-learning, multi-transfer um, type uh, of, of learning and training where I am certain that chat GPT, I don't know what they might mean. Maybe it wasn't specifically fine-tuned for machine translation, but I guarantee you it saw some data that was transliterative in some ways. So it's been exposed to Spanish, and part of the whole concept behind, you know, the zero or uh, all of these different types of trans task transfer is that given some uh, you know, the fact that it might have been asked to translate one language into another before, if it's seen Spanish and then you prompt it to do some translation. Right. Like it can definitely talk to you in Spanish, like any high resource language, it'll be able to talk to you. And it's just, just fascinating to me that it's like, it can't translate, but it can speak the language. Yeah. It, and it, I, I, I would, I would have to play around with it. I have yeah. not played around with it at all, but like, I've seen articles and such like that, that basically like, if you give it like a prompt that suggests that it should translate from English to Spanish, it can figure exactly. out. How to, yeah. Yeah. And that's like, that's not like, again, like that's a con, like. It will have seen things that are like that. You know, if you have multilingual chats, things of that general nature, stuff, it will pick up that skill set as again, like again, like you have to think about how vast the internet is. Like that type of stuff is just going to exist out in the wild because. Um, so asking it to do, do like again, like you, I'm pretty sure you would get a translation. Now the, the question is, is how good is the translation going to be? Um, you know, like if you asked it to translate from like English to, you know some like the language that I work with a lot is a language called Tigrinya. If you ask you to translate into Tigrinya, it's not, it's not going to have a clue. Um, but like, if you, you know, again, like Spanish, that's such a prevalent language. Like it would be surprising that it, if it did not know how to do that, but this is kind of like, you know, just part of the actual training process. Again, it's not so much that it's, 
Um, it, it's going to be able to support, you know, many multi-languages, which is because that's a focus, an area of focus that they're going to go do or that, you know, companies, they want to be able to support as many people in as many languages as possible to use it. Um, so, but yeah, that's, that's more of a byproduct of perhaps just, um, uh, just the, the the vast amount of data that it's been trained on, even if it wasn't specifically fine-tuned to do machine translation, it was trained under a multitask setting. So it's the idea is that it should be able to complete said task and then have a conversation with you about it in the like, you know, or in some way, or to translate whatever it's doing into a dialogue. Um, and I, I'm sure there's been a lot of poli like manual policy, you know, overrides like if, if we had time I really wish that I had gotten to like walk you through how like the little diagram um about how chat GPT is actually trained because I think that would actually have been you know much more informative about like that specifically the question that you're asking um but I can always send you you know an article or something like that if that would be useful a question that that has come up in the chat that I think is is relevant is um what good is this technology why why bother is it just a neat little game that we're putting tons of the energy and, and money into that's going to make a lot of money for people what good is it for humanity is it just making humans stupid i think it can yeah. oh, jess you want to go yeah um also just to bounce off camera we're, we are going to share some documents with you that we've assembled so lots of we have lots of articles about different things and we have some lesson ideas and also other language generator eyes we've sort of compiled them so we'll make sure we get all those shared with the open lab too and as well as with the department of our resource page for this uh for this event perfect um yeah go ahead cam oh yeah i was just gonna like i i, I do think that the, the technology if again viewed as an aid for domain experts it's incredible it can expedite your 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 efficiency on your job like like whatever it may be again like if you have like like for me, like I gave the example of like code documentation, like, you know, not having to go back and, you know, generate comments, you know, to go through and explain how all of this code works, allows me to go write more code that I don't then have to, you know, like I have to vet the comments that it comes out with. I know how to do that. And then like, you know, I can move on to the next task. Writing code, like writing that documentation could take me hours. Chat GPT might be able to do it in minutes, you know? Um, from like a, a writer's perspective, I think about this technology a lot as like doing, I love as Jess knows, doing writer analytics. And for me, like uh, like what I was interested in when I was at a master's student um, was, you know, how, like, what can this tell us about student writing? Like, obviously, like it's it's the, the, the question of abuse versus intended use. Um, as humans, people have always had a tendency to abuse technology. And that would be, you know, to have chat GPT, write your essays, do all that kind of stuff. Um, the intended use is, again, to be an aid or a tool to someone that has expertise in whatever they're doing. Um, and that's where I think it it's, could be of super use, you know, where you can have it, uh, you know, do interesting analysis. Like, I could probably have asked GPT to explain itself to you, and it probably could have come and, like, say, explain transfer learning or explain, uh, explain uh, you know, what a transformer model is in yeah. 2004. And it probably it's, would have given you a decent explanation on that. Yeah, it's um, really good at anything meta related to chat GPT or AI. So, and that's kind of fun to play with. Yeah. Um, just to bounce off you real quick, Cameron, yeah. uh, to get this whole idea, is this making us, you know, stupider or is this like dangerous? Um, I think I agree with that. It, it, it is a tool. We've got to remember it's been put out by a company that's kind of unethical. So do we want to use it anyways? So that's kind of a problem. Um but I know some people, for example, at the writing center at UNH, the they used it uh, to make a schedule, and it saved the person hours. And I, how did they do that? I don't know. That there's a guide how to do scheduling in ChatGPT, and it will schedule for you. Like whoa! So there there are other things other than just having fun with it and writing essays that it can do really well. And that's where I see it is more in like a, a business and administrative kind of uh, environment where, you know, I think there was a comment earlier about how, you know, business is driven by metrics and, you know, performance and speed. Um, so for the creative purposes, I don't think it's, you know, great for, you know, again, generating the next great thinkers or this or that or the third, but it can, you know, again, it is great for expediting tedious processes, things that we don't want to do, but have to do anyway, is where I see it being most applicable.
Well, a question in the chat makes me wonder, a comment makes me wonder, can it do works cited pages? Because if chat GPT hey. can write works cited pages, hey. I'm all for it. Me too. It, it should be able to like, there's actually, that is like, I'm glad that you brought this up. <laughs> I actually just yeah. read the paper today. Or, like, so that's been one of the biggest pushes like about like chat GPT and around that in the AI community, like the ethics community is getting it to cite where it got its stuff. Um, it's like, where did you pull this from? You need to be able to, you know, put a citation in there about it. Like, you know, where, like, where did this source come from? And then I think even just as of today, I saw a tweet about a paper that was just published that insinuated that like, basically they fine-tuned, they improved chat GPT's performance and its ability to respond by um, basing, like having it search through cited stuff first, essentially, and then kind of like, like, so basically rewriting the ranking policy to like bias it towards stuff that is cited and, you know, well known and away from like just random stuff that it sees on the internet. Um, so that's a whole other question of like how that's going to impact students and things like that. But there is certainly a push. It should in not too long be able to make a work cited page. Like that is like, like you said, one of the most tedious bits of work. And I, I don't see any reason why it would not be able to formulate such, such a thing. Um, so I am certain that if not someone, I can work on that. <laughs> um, yeah, I've tried to have it do some work cited pages and you gotta be careful because it does hallucinate, right? Sometimes it goes, this is the, this is the work site. And like, no, that is absolutely wrong. So well, I wouldn't have it automatically, like, you know, just like read your text and be like, okay, pull where this came from. But like, given a specific citation mm. that is already in text, being able to generate a full citations page or like a work cited based on the cited things in the text, that I don't think should be very difficult or hard. Yeah, I haven't actually tried that. That's a good idea. So those are some uses. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of good uses and then a lot of abuses that, you know, and people are always going to, you know, look for shortcuts and ways to, you know, take advantage of technology. And that's just kind of the way that the world is. And it it's the the means by which to deter the abuses always is slower than the generation of the abuse um, because it's more profitable. Um, and so until, you know, true harm is done, usually it's always reactive as opposed to proactive. So um, but we're trying to change that. <laughs> I have a question when it comes to the abuse of um, the system. And you had said towards the beginning, someone brought up the example of you can't ask it for the recipe to make methamphetamine, but if you ask it to put itself in a fantasy world, and like they're like all of the ways people are coming up with how to break those systems and find out illegal information, all that sort of stuff. Um, is there an ethical concern for? like asking a computer illegal information, but specifically like trying to break the rules that it's set up for. I have heard someone talking about like, do we, you know, we're not necessarily at this point yet, but it's the whole thing of, do we want to teach any AI system that we're going to lie to it? Mm -hmm. um, like, I don't know if that's something that's been in conversation at all. I don't know that it's going to be able to recognize that it's being lied to again like it's just getting it's receiving a prompt and if you engineer your prompts such that you can bypass the gates that the engineers like because so all of that illegal information that is those are manual or like intentional gates that have been put on the machine in order to like keep it from answering certain questions but it's fairly easy to you know again work the prompt such that uh to reword or rework the prompt such that it does not fit the criteria for getting blocked by said gate so what it does become i, I know businesses are you know very very much uh you know fig try having to figure this out quick because there's a lot of discussion about now whether the entities themselves can be held legally liable for you know certain things when people do bad things based on suggestions that a search engine, uh, you know, gives them because there used to be a level of separation before where it was like, okay, if you search this, I then send you to a list of websites. And so it's on the individual website to, you know, like whether, you know, what happens based on that. So you're protected, but with, you know, these particular systems, because they are directly giving you a, you know, a suggestion or talking to you, you know, basically that you have bypassed that website. Now there is ethical concern because, uh, you know, you, your, your business can be held liable, you know, for giving that information. 
whether it be illegal or not. Um, so the system itself, I don't know that there's that much concern about like the system, you know, understanding that it's being lied to or not, because it won't really understand. It just will be like, oh, I got a new question. I can answer this and it's going to answer it. But the business itself, they're going to be concerned about that because, you know, that means lawsuits, um, yeah. which they don't like. I'll also warn you, if you are someone who wants to experiment with jailbreaking chat GPT, uh, they're starting to ban people for doing it. So that's a good way to get yourself permanently removed from the program. So I don't recommend trying it yourself. <laughs> Easiest way to deal with it, ban them. The, the, the typical internet strategy. <laughs> yeah, shut it down. I, you I know we're sort of out of time, but... Right? Like, I'm sorry, I'm just surprised <laughs> that they're banning people. Like you'd think this would be good for them to know what mm -hmm. causes it to break. I don't know. They still have your data though, that's the thing. So they'll still know yeah. what you said that caused it to break. Yeah, but like if, um, if, if people banned. stop doing it because they're afraid of getting banned, then that's going to, I don't know. Yeah, I think we're, and again, you know, how long is it going to be until we start having to see a $20 a month subscription service to mess around with ChatGPT? Maybe a couple months, maybe this summer. It could happen sooner think. rather than later. I don't think they're going to get that far. Oh. Um, I don't think they're, sorry, yeah, that's, you know, mom wanting to go to dinner. But, um, <laughs> um <laughs> She's in town, but um, no, we I, are I, mostly I, out of time. But I do want to ask one last question about what what you started with about like, or what you said at one point, just like, well, it is an unethical company, so blah 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 blah. And there are so many, um, you know, this this one is very popular right now, and it's very wide scale. But there's lots of very large unethical tech companies right now, and they're very hard to like extricate yourself from them, just like. You know, they may be mining your stuff, even if you've resisted using them um, or subscribing to them or anything. So I guess my question is like, when you do come across technologies that you feel like are problematic, like maybe there's some good things you can do with it, but like there's a certain kind of rottenness at its core. Um, what do you, I, you know, I, I'm curious where you two stand with your expertise in terms of, do you just resist it? Do you fight it? Do you get in it and try to improve it? Do you like, how do you tackle those questions about um, very large, powerful tech companies that are creating things that are changing the world around us? Um, I'll just jump in real quick and then you can have uh, your answer, Cam. Like I think about it in terms of need. Uh, right now, I kind of need this cell phone. But I also know, thanks to Matt Cheney, uh, partially, that you know, there's a lot of like bloodstained cobalt in this thing, and it's sort of you know horrible, right? But at the same time, I kind of need this thing for my life. Do I really need Chat GPT? Uh, I think the answer is probably going to be no. And so I'm going to fall into the camp of uh, probably closing my account down and maybe even having Chat GPT write a strongly worded letter of, about OpenAI's unethical processes and then sending that to them. Yeah. And I mean, on my end, because like, you know, I work with this stuff fairly like I like from my perspective, it's more like these technologies are coming. So for me, I kind of like feel like I have to enter the conversation and enter the space. So like I feel like chat GPT, I don't think is going to last. It's not going to get that much further, to be honest. I think it's got maybe a year because Google's coming out with their version like they've had the same technology, just, you know, they haven't released it to the public facing because, you know, they you know, want to wrap it much more prettier and figure out how they're going to sell it to users. Um, but it's coming and it's going to be bigger and probably better if probably better. Um, and it'll reach more people. So in my mind, it's like, okay, like these, these technologies are here, they're coming. And what's going to end up, what ends up happening is that they become less public facing, much less like the interface goes away and it just gets ingrained into the back end of things. Um, that, uh, you know, so like basically it's, you're not going to have like a chat GPT interface anymore. It's just going to, your, your chat machines and the things that you interact with on a daily basis are going to be back into by these things. So being aware of, you know, what's going on, how they're being trained, all of that kind of stuff, it kind of uh, makes it necessary to, you know, step in and have people that are, you know, pushing for, you know, hey, this is unethical or, you know, we should be, do, you know, safegating this or, you know, like having these conversations and pushing for these types of changes internally. 
um, because otherwise, you know, they won't do it for the most part, again, and unless it does some major catastrophic public harm, or again, like they are threatened monetarily with lawsuit or something like that, those are generally the motivators. Um, so it's kind of one of those spaces where like, if I don't, like it's like Jeff said, if I don't actually need it, like I won't do anything with chat GPT because I don't need it on a regular basis, but I do think about how it could be useful integrated into my already workflow. Like, you know, if I could build out like, you know, one thing I'm like, well, why don't I, you know, experiment with building around out a thing that, you know, like automatically generates documentation for my code. So that way I don't even have to think about it. I don't have to ask chat GPT. I just, you know, it just does it. Um, that's kind of where the technology ends up going. And so I try to be thinking about like, you know, where's it headed next and what do we need to be aware of in order to make sure that, you know, the public is safe in you more as safe as they can be in using it because it, you're going to end up using it regardless of whether you want to or not. Um, yeah. Said, like Jess said. Um, yeah. I did have one last thing I wanted to share with everyone. So maybe to fight a little bit of the doom and gloom. This is probably my favorite poem I've had chat GPT, right? So I, I had someone, I, I asked a, a, an audience, let's have it write a poem. And someone said, write the poem about death. And someone else said, right, about Cheerios. So we did death and Cheerios in the style of William Carlos Williams. So <laughs> death comes for us all, even Cheerios in a bowl, crunchy no more. Oh, if you go back, <laughs> to, there's, a, there's not my, that bad. Uh, uh, whatchamacallit is there. Uh, That's like my idea of what is not doom and gloom, Jess. I've had such an influence on you. <laughs> All right, any last questions? Awareness plus critical thinking, yeah. All right, well, thank you to uh, Jess and to Cameron for a great presentation.